So Richard just gave you one set of visuals and one set of explanations for a framework for thinking about the distribution of ecology and species. And I'm basically going to repeat exactly the same thing in two other ways for you. Okay, so excuse the repetition. This does become really, really critical if you're trying to understand both the methodologies that we're using, but also the literature. Uh, what you'll find is that these concepts are not always clear in everybody's minds. Uh, and so the literature can get confusing as well. So that's kind of why we're belaboring the point. Uh, just essentially giving you a little bit of a historical background. That's Joseph Grinnell. And you'll notice in, in Richard's talk that he referred several times to the Grinnellian, sorry, Richard, the Grinnellian niche. That'll probably be the only time I remember to say it that way. Uh, so this paper was published in 1970. And in another paper published also in 1970, so 95 years ago, here's a very interesting thing. Look at the list of environmental factors that are important in determining the distributional ecology of species that Grinnell gives basically in the paper that first uses the word niche in biology. There was one previous mention, basically. But essentially, those are exactly the same dimensions that we're using right now in our GIS-based model. So in one sense, you can say we haven't gotten very far in 95 years. Um, or in another sense, you can say that Joseph Grinnell was before his time. Now, the word niche, niche, I'm getting tired of this, um, got used more and more frequently as ecology became a science. Uh, I'm going to highlight for you two other uses. One is by Charles Elton in the 1920s, where he spoke as niche, as essentially the species role in the community, what it does in the community. And then later still, particularly in the 1950s, we have G.M. Warren Hutchinson, who referred to the niche as this uh, multidimensional uh, cloud, perhaps, that was composed both of abiotic, or Richard used the, the term senopoietic, which is the term that Hutchinson used, these abiotic physical variables that are not affected by the species, and separately, what Hutchinson called bionomic variables, or biotic variables, are things that can be affected by the species. So maybe we're talking about populations of prey, where if the populations of the species we're interested in go high, they will depress the prey populations. Okay? So we can refer to Hutchinson's bionomic and senopoietic variables as ones that are linked to the population ecology of the species in question, or ones that are not linked. Okay? So it really wasn't until the late 1990s, early 2000s, that we start to put all these different concepts together. Uh, I should have put a, another paper up by Ronald Pulliam in 2000, uh, and then five years later, uh, Jorge Soberon and I tried to uh, perhaps bring it a little bit closer to home for the niche modeling world, uh, but essentially start to put together these different uses of the term niche, okay? Uh, so this is perhaps the, the one key thing that I want to show you right now. Uh, and it's a framework for understanding distributional areas and you're talking about. So we think about some universal <coughs> interest, and we think about within that geographical space, there's some set of areas that are right for the species given its physiological requirements. Okay, we're going to call that A. And essentially, you can think about the species is physically happy there. Okay, right temperature, 
right amount of rainfall, right amount of humidity, etc. As you well know, that's not everything. Okay, so we also have to take into account the biotic environment. We're going to come back to the question of to what degree these two circles frequently intersect like that, or maybe the B circle is much broader and is rarely in the string. We'll come back to that in a bit. But this was essentially how Jim and Hutchinson viewed distributional ecology. You have the fundamental niche and the area that that permits the species to inhabit. And then that fundamental niche is reduced by competitive interactions with other species. And that, in turn, produces a reduced potential distribution, which uh, he referred to as the realized. And so we have those two areas. Uh, but Hutchinson left out one piece of the puzzle. And this would be kind of the one failing in the, in the viewpoint that he put forward. And that is, as Richard pointed out to you, not all of those suitable areas are accessible. And so we're going to bring in a third consideration, which we could call mobility or dispersal. But essentially, this is making the point that not all of the suitable areas are uh, inhabited by the species. Exactly what Richard just showed you. Now, those of you who work here at the CFA, you work quite a bit with invasive species. Homie and I just wrote a paper about red palm weevils, which were restricted to the old world until, by one means or another, they jumped across the ocean and they show up in California. All of a sudden, what's happened is that that M circle has expanded. And I'll show you a quick example of, of how that works in just a moment. So we need to think about the idea that those, that hatched area, those di that diagonal shaping, that's the area that is both suitable abiotically, suitable biotically, and accessible to the species. So we really, in general, should find occurrences only right there. Okay? That's what we call the band framework. Biotic, abiotic, <coughs> and movement and mobility. That area that's, that's stippled is the area that would be interesting to any of you who are interested in invasive species animals. Because those are the places that are presently across some dispersal area and inaccessible to the species. But with one little jump, with, with five mosquitoes crossing a river or an ocean or whatever, you have the potential to invade those areas. And those areas, to the limits of the environment that we are studying, those areas are putatively habitable. So, M, those barriers can take various forms. Uh, if I live in the forest, maybe that mountain range is a pretty formidable barrier. If I live in the forest and don't like to swim, maybe this river is. Or maybe looking from one mountain range to another, a day. What have you. Given the natural history of the species, given the tolerance of the species, given the movement ability of the species, M can be constituted, constituted by a lot of different factors. The comment is simply that uh, dispersal is not universal. A species does not distribute universally across the surface of the earth anywhere where it's suitable. So that's the band diagram that I just showed you. And I'm not going to assert that one of these two configurations is true, or the other. But I want you to think about the degree to which biotic interactions are frequently limited at coarse geographic scales. Okay, That's the really critical one. I'll tell you a little story. I was in New Zealand, and I gave a talk like this. It was a few years ago. And I proposed this, this hypothesis that we call the Altonian noise hypothesis. 
which is the idea that at macro geographic scale, maybe biotic interactions are not frequently limited. And the folks in, the, in the New Zealand who've lost most of their endemic vertebrates to competition with invasive species from other continents, they said, no, 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 you're wrong. Look, look how the, this introduced species and that introduced species have wiped out our whole avifaun. Look at the, the such and such species. And at first thought, it was a very good point, which is to say there obviously is a point where competition is so extreme that a species is wiped out or eliminated from major parts of its distribution. The funny end of the story is I'm an ornithologist, okay, I study birds, and so when I took off at the end of my visit to, to travel a bit around New Zealand, and Obviously, I was visiting native forest patches uh, to see some of the few remaining native birds. <clears throat> I was going to one forest patch, and one of the same people who had argued with me about the Altonian noise hypothesis said, oh, by the way, the such and such species, endemic to New Zealand, has recolonized that forest patch, so you might just see it. And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I win. Because the macro geographic distribution of the species hadn't changed, even though it had disappeared for a few years from a given forest patch. If you were standing at the back of the room, the map hadn't changed. So I just want you to think about, as you do your work and as we go through this course, how frequently do biotic interactions in impose geographic limitations on species? Okay, just a little bit of comment about areas, distributional areas, versus subsets of environmental space. So essentially, uh, areas of distribution are the spatial manifestation of those environmental conditions that make up the ecological niche. So we have to go back and forth between geographic space and environmental space. And these two spaces can have very strange relationships between them. So this is a, a plot of temperature and precipitation across the Americas. And I can do something very obvious. Look at the green area. I can take the hottest and wettest areas. So that's lowland rainforest. And there's the Amazon basin. And in fact, it very nicely reconstructs the, the limits of lowland rainforest in the Americas. They get up just to central Mexico and down to central South America. So that's very simple. But then look at this. We take medium temperatures and low precipitation, and we get this area. And that is what we call the taiga belt. It's essentially coniferous forests across northern North America. But notice that there's also some blue shading here. I can cite for you dozens and dozens and dozens of examples of species that are endemic to that northern area, and probably hundreds of examples of species endemic to those Andean areas. But I can't cite for you a single example of a species that inhabits all of that blue area. <coughs> That's the effect of M. Okay, that's the effect of dispersal limitation. A species evolves or disperses into this area, it's not going to have hemispheric dispersal ability, but only very rarely. And so it's not going to be able to colonize these other areas that are also suitable. 